Good evening and welcome to the Independent Herald Candidate Forum tonight. We're coming to you live from the Oneida Municipal Building. We want to thank Oneida Mayor Lori Phillips-Jones for the hospitality and the setup here. We appreciate the opportunity to bring you candidates that are involved in the August 1st general election. And of course, currently, early voting is open for all of these offices. And tonight's goal is to bring you information about the candidates and let them make their case to you. And we have different segments this evening. Most of it is going to be school board coming up. We'll have the second district school board representative. We'll have representatives from the third district. Both of those are Scott County school board races. And finally tonight, we will have representatives that are running for two seats on the Oneida Special School District. But first up tonight, uh, we have Assessor of Property, and we're gonna talk about that. I do wanna remind you where you can watch tonight so that you can remind friends that you may have, uh, if they don't have one kind of media, there's another one that they perhaps could watch on. So tonight we are on the Independent Herald Facebook page. We're also on YouTube on the Independent Herald page on, in, on the IH Sports Network page and on the South Fork Network page, as well as South Fork Network Twitch. And then uh, up and down the 27 corridor, we're on Highland Television Media on channel 190, live tonight. And we will be broadcasting for the next few hours with the Candidate Forum brought to you by the Independent Herald. My name's Tim Smith. I'll be your host for this evening. I'll be asking the questions and we'll begin first with, as I said, assessor of property. And earlier uh, or late last week, uh, there was uh, an exit from the race by Tim Phillips. And so we only have one candidate actively seeking the office, but Tiffany Jeffers, who is the current, the incumbent for assessor of property is here with us. And so Tiffany, first I wanna welcome you and thank you for coming. And uh, I know that this is, uh, when I first was told that, that uh, you were the only one continuing in the race, I asked, is Tiffany still wanting to come talk to us? And I was told, yes, absolutely. She, <laughs> she wants to speak to the people of Scott County. So my first question would be, why did you want to take this opportunity? Well, I wanted to come out here and um, uh, thank you all for letting me be here. I wanted to come out here and all, um, ask the people to still get out and vote. Uh, I appreciate Mr. Phillips making his statement that he no longer pursued the office, but his name is still on the ballot. So I ask everyone to still get out there and vote. I do want this job. I've been here for 20 years now. Uh, July 1st made 20 years for me being in the assessor's office. I worked under um, Steve Thompson and Tony Sexton, and then I was appointed the assessor and elected the assessor, and now I'm running again on our regular term. Now, throughout my lifetime, uh, offices of trustee, assessor of property, I've kind of thought I knew what they did, but maybe I didn't really know, and perhaps even I sit here now, and I'm not <laughs> completely sure. And I, I figure that's probably the case for a lot of people. When, when they hear assessor of property, there can be a lot of things that are implied with that, misunderstandings right. that can take place. But what I'd ask you to do now is just explain to the folks of Scott County what is the responsibility of the Office of Property Assessor and then also what is not within the realm of that office? Well, I think when people hear, um, they used to have the term tax assessor. So when you hear taxes, people automatically think all we do is tax the people, the citizens. But actually there's a lot that goes into it. Um, for example, it starts off when a deed is recorded, we get that deed and work it, whether it be a transfer of property from one individual to another. Uh, we have to change the names on the appraisal card. If it's part of a, a property, if you're only getting part of it, we have to map that and split it and assign a new map and parcel to that property. So um, we can identify by name or address. We can look property up that way, but our main identifier in the office is by map and parcel and that um, connects it to your property. So we work with the deeds, we work with mapping. Um, even if it's not a split, we if a survey is recorded, we're responsible for mapping that on the maps and everything now too is online and um, when we change something in our office I believe it's updated weekly on the Tennessee State website and maps are the same way now so that's came a long way and it makes everything more uh, readily it's, it's there for the public you don't have to wait for it to update so we update all the appraisal information we also work with personal property which is um, it's business personal property. So if you own a business, 
We are responsible for taxing the items in that business. So we are responsible for personal property. Um, we work with commercial property. So if there's a, a commercial, a, a new building out there, we, we pick that up. Or if, if it were to transfer, we would transfer that name. Um, we Public utilities, is that's taxed by OSAP. So they take care of that. Um, and then just questions by the public if they come in and want to know who their neighbor is, we can tell them that. Or if they think there's an issue with a property line, we can pull those deeds and remap that or, or give them that, all that information. So uh, let me ask you, I think sometimes there's, uh, there's a, a, a misperception that you have an impact on the actual tax rate. Is right. that true or is that false? No, the actual tax rate, um, during a reappraisal it's a little different, but the actual tax rate is set by the commissioners, so they get to de decide what that is. They do take in our appraisal information. With the reappraisal, just like we, we had in 2023, the county can't make money on that, so the state does set, that, set the, the rate, but the county commission has the authority to raise that. Okay, and you said that that reassessment happened in 2023. Do you Correct. decide when that happens or are you told when that's going to happen? Um, right now it is a set date by the state. It's every five years. Um, there's talk in the Senate representatives of changing that because the last reappraisal was so drastic. So they're, they're talking of changing that to possibly a, a two, three, or four, but that's still in the works. And it, it, when it does come to that, right now we're still 2028. They're not going to change it until after that, but I would sit down and talk with CTAS and the DPA and the county mayor and see what's best for our county. Okay. Um, so I, the question about assessor of property, and I, these questions formulated for me when there was, it was not just a one person race, but I still think it's important to ask, why is it important who performs the duties of assessor of property? Well, I feel like um, the appraisals, our, our job is to be fair, and it's, it's important to go out there when you're measuring a house. We, we measure homes and put it on the tax roll, and there's, it depends on the type of roof, where that's at. So I think it's important to know when you're out there how to measure a home, and then when you bring it back in the office, um, how to key it in and then we do make mistakes but if we catch that we we correlate our work we um, check each other's work and try to make sure and we're also audited by the state uh, we don't just get to make up these numbers but there's there's a lot more that goes into it than just um, keying it or topping it topping it in so i feel like it's important to be fair to the people to know what you're putting in there and you're, you're dealing with people's property. So I feel like it's important to get that correct. Let me ask you staffing wise, how many people uh, staff your office? How many staff do you have? Um, currently we have uh, Virginia Winchester. She's been there 18 years with me. She's uh, great at key and deeds, personal property. We have um, Lyndall Shepard, he's my field guy. He goes out and does all the field work. He helps in the office. My uh, newest member is Ashley Boshear. She's there. She's take, she helps with field work and also commercial. She's taken that on. And Missy Sexton, she's part-time, and she jumps in there with phone calls, uh, helping with the deeds. And, and they're all fantastic. I couldn't do this job without them. They, they help when anybody comes in with questions. And, yeah, I have the best staff. All right. I, I don't think there's any office or any area that doesn't have errors. You mentioned sometimes errors are made. Uh, what is your style of dealing with public complaints? And I'm, I'm sure, um, you know, I've, I've been on the customer service end at times. Sometimes people are highly uh, upset at times. Right. How, what is your method of dealing with folks who are upset about uh, an item? Well, I feel like any time you're dealing with taxes, um, people a lot of times don't want to, to pay taxes. and But more importantly, they want it to be correct. And when they come in... Um, I, I can't just lower property just to lower it. If they have a reason, we, we take private appraisals. We see if we have made a mistake. We also don't go in home. So we may make a mistake on what's actually in that house and we're happy to correct that when they come in. Um, also with uh, better technology, we're upgrading the GIS system and we're, our keying approach has upgraded. So, um, 
I think our oldest map in the office is 1979. So the state took those and did the best they can with them. So now that people are able to get on the computer and see how their property's mapped, they could very well see a mistake. So when they come in, if it's a mapping error, we pull those deeds, pull those surveys, and try to get as close as we can. Right. Tiffany, I thank you for coming in. And uh, just by way of closing, I, I may not have asked a question that's important uh, for the people of Scott County to know, something that, that you understand better than me or just something that you want to say to the folks of Scott County. And so this final moment's untimed. Just, uh, you, you just let the people know what you would like them to know and remember about your time here. Um, I just ask that you get out and vote. I've been here 20 years and I would love to stay. And if you ever have an issue or a question, please come in and talk to us. Um, if there's anything I didn't cover, I'd be happy to go over it with you. All right. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you for being here. And uh, we thank you uh, for joining us for this first segment of the Candidate Forum here tonight. We'll continue with Second District School Board for Scott County. When we return, want to thank Tiffany Jeffers, Assessor of Property. She is uh, the lone candidate remaining in the race on the ballot. And the general election again is August 1st. Early voting is open right now. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Independent Herald Candidate Forum tonight. We want to remind you, you can watch on the Independent Herald Facebook page. You can watch on several YouTube channels, including the Independent Herald channel, IHSN, and the South Fork Network channel. You can also watch on South Fork Network's Twitch channel. And then finally, on Highland Media Television, the Big South Fork Network's Channel 190 will be broadcasting our events this evening. So uh, if you know someone that would be interested in this, coming up a little bit later, we've got 3rd District for County School Board. We have the Oneida Special School District Board race as well. And right now joining us from the 2nd District of Scott County School Board race, we have Miss Diane Chambers-Smith. And so, uh, Diane, first of all, I want to thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, I will remind everyone that all candidates were invited to participate in tonight's event. And, uh, and we thank you for accepting this tonight. And just the first question I'm going to ask you right off the top is why did you choose to run for Scott County School Board in the second district this year? Well, as you probably already know, I was in the education system in Scott County for about 40 years. And my last 24 years was spent as an actual teacher. I was a secretary for five years and I was a teacher assistant. And then I took some time off working full time and I was a, uh, a substitute teacher. So I have worked in many jobs with the school system and I felt like I had something to offer. And so then I decided that I wanted to be a teacher so I could make a difference. Kids have been always been a very important thing to me. I was uh, raised in a large family and I was one of the older children and I always was taking care of children from the time I was five years old, I was taking care of children. And I'm still doing that. And I like to be involved in everything that's going to try to make their lives better. And education is one of the things that we need to educate our kids to be ready for society. But we need to love them and show them a nurturing way of teaching them. So I just felt like I had something to offer my experience and I also have been running some businesses since I retired eight years ago, and I felt that would help me in making decisions about budgets. All right, so uh, let, let's talk a little bit about uh, the board in the last few years that, uh, that you're hoping to be a part of in the future. And we'll look at both sides of this, but the first thing I wanna ask you is, uh, no matter what uh, organization or group we're talking about, there's gonna be good things and there's going to be bad things. So I'd like to talk about the good first. What are some things that you've seen from the Scott County School Board in the last few years that you think they made good decisions on? This is something that was a, a good direction to go. Well, one of the things I noticed when I was on the board is uh, the need for security. That was when we had a lot of the shootings going on and we had the bad shooting in Nashville. And uh, our board jumped on that right away and started fixing up everything to be more secure in our schools and they couldn't afford it by themselves so they got help from community resources. I remember Tuckahata was really instrumental in helping us get security set up for Scott High School. That's one of the big things I saw happening and uh, 
and also notice that our kids are more we're getting more support for those kids that are not uh, athletes like we have very good kids that are in band and the scholars program and they've gone on and made their name out in society already that they've done well in college and they're going on to make something big of themselves and I see the Scott County system really supporting those kids more than just the athletes and athlete, athletics is very important. I agree with that. I'm very big in athletics myself, always have been. But I think that we need to help the kids that are not just athletes or the best looking or the fastest runner. We have kids uh, across the board that need help in many ways. And uh, we have a lot of special needs children. And I see our system helping those kids and meeting the challenges that they ha have getting an education. We're meeting the needs of those uh, special needs children. And that's going to be something that's going to be happening more so, more than ever. And it's just part of our society. And I see Scott County getting on board with that. Again, we're talking with Diane Chambers-Smith. She is a candidate for Scott County School Board in the second district. And uh, Ms. Smith, I'll ask you now, uh, what are some things that you've seen over the past few years that maybe you would have chosen a different direction, board actions that have been taken that, that you feel like maybe should have been done differently? Well, um, there's the way they spend money. I think that that could have been uh, done a little bit different. And, and it's hard to decide some of those things. Like all the systems got a lot of money through COVID and, and it was put out there so quickly that I felt like sometimes we didn't make the best decisions on how we spent the COVID money. We could have done it a little differently. And, uh, but see, all that came at us so quickly that we didn't have a lot of time to be able to research what was the best way. And for that, I think that we could have spent money a little differently. And one of the biggest things I see that we need to do is fixing up the Scott High School. Our school is an old school now. And the heating and air conditioning system is, it's shot. And it should have been, something should have been done about it. But, you know, I'm not the one that makes those big decisions. And like I say, the money was put out there so quickly that sometimes we might have made some mistakes on how we spent that. Not a, a lot of it, but there were some things that could have been done differently there. All right. Are there any concerns exclusive to your district, to the second district? Are, are there certain uh, things that you would like to address in the next four years for the second district of the Scott County School Board? Well, I would like to see our enrollment increase, but until we get some kind of an industry and housing in Robbins, we will not get a lot of uh, new people coming in. But the enrollment has gone down tremendously in some of the county schools because there's not housing and there's no industry in that uh, place. But I'm doing what I can in the second district to make it a more um, interesting and more inviting place to be. Our community club has really worked hard on the Robbins Community Park making it beautiful and more accessible for people who's wanting to walk or, you know, just play, a place to go and play. And we keep it looking very nice. And uh, so with the community club, we spend a lot of time and money keeping the park up. And another thing we've started down there is having a monthly bingo uh, meeting. And that has just taken off. We have so much interest. There's a lot of older people that has no place to go out very far and we uh, serve food so they have a place to eat and just have a good uh, fun night with their own community people. We have people coming from all over the county now to our bingo and it's very interesting how that has just taken off. It's such a simple idea that's been accepted so well. And so let me ask you as a former, uh, you've served before, and so what, what is your method of handling when someone comes to you with a complaint uh, about the system or about a school or about school personnel? How do you handle a complaint? Well, the first thing I have to tell them that I will have to check it out. I just can't take just a person's word on it. It has to be checked out. And I usually go to uh, 
uh, Mr. Hall, because if you want to know something, you just can't go to this person and that person. You have to go straight to the horse's mouth and find out the information. But one of the things I want to say is you've got to address it immediately. Don't say, well, I'll check into it. You check into it that day, it's, if it's at all possible, or the next day. And try to trace it down because a lot of parents get really upset about things that they think is going on in their system, which, and it hasn't been. You just have to find out all the, you know, the things that's going on, and then you let them know how it is. And the law, the law has changed about a lot of things, and you have to let them know this is what the school board or Mr. Hall can legally do about this situation. But uh, I would like to see our enrollment building at Robbins, and so I feel like we've got a very good school. I always have. We've had some great people to. Uh, go to school at Robbins that's gone out and done some good things. I, I will say there's one exception, and that would be Ben Garrett. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we can't argue with you there, and I okay. certainly don't have time for that argument. But uh, what, what would you hope to see uh, in the next four years? You're elected to the school board as the second district representative. What would you hope to see happen for Scott County Schools? Well, the one thing I'd like to see is the school board members working closer together and not one going off on one thing and one going off. I think they need to be involved together. And another thing that I think it's important is if we try to work closer with the Oneida school system because a lot of people in Oneida system have people that goes to school in the Scott County system and we should all be united. We can be separate but we can be united at the same time. And I would like to see us doing things together more often. I'd like to see the sports team playing ball and, you know, competing in different things. And it's starting, but I would like to see us working closer with the Oneida system. And I know a lot of people think, especially seems like the older people, they said, no, we don't want to be like Oneida. We want to be Scott County. Well, we're all Scott County. And I just want to see a more united front on that. All right, and I'm going to give you a closing moment here. Diane Chambers-Smith, she is a candidate for Scott County School Board in the 2nd District, and just anything that you haven't been able to address that you want to say to the people who are voting, this is your time. Okay, thank you. I appreciate you all giving me this opportunity. But um, I feel like with my education background and with my business background and the I've exemplified working with the young people, still interested in the young people and how they succeed in life, not just since I quit teaching. And I want to be able to help them out in any way I can. And I just feel like I have a heart for the kids because the kids are what needs the help and they need a voice with the, the school board and Scott County. And I'd like to be that voice. All right. Well, we thank you for joining us. Uh, Diane Chambers-Smith, again, a candidate for Scott County School Board in the 2nd District. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for joining us here tonight. This is the Independent Herald Candidate Forum, and we will return with 3rd District candidates for Scott County School Board after this. Welcome back to the Independent Herald Forum can Candidate Forum here tonight, and uh, we welcome you along as you're watching, and we want to tell you that we now have a couple of candidates uh, that are competing for the same race. So the rules will be the same for the next two sections. Since there are several candidates vying for uh, one seat, or in the case of the Oneida School District, five candidates for two seats, what we will do prior to the start is we draw numbers to see who will go first in the opening statement, and in this case, who will go last in the opening statement because there's two candidates and then whoever goes first in the opening statement will then go last in the closing statement. So I'm going to try to keep that straight and, and uh, my candidates, I've gone over that with them here tonight and most of all I want to thank uh, Chris Shelton and Curtis Bruce. They are Scott County School Board candidates for the third district. They're the only two candidates on the ballot. They both agreed to come here tonight to share their thoughts on why they should be the next representative of the third district on Scott County School Board. And I can't thank them enough because this is not an, an easy thing, especially if you're not used to doing that. So uh, we're going to ask some questions to them tonight with the goal being so that you get to know both of them better and their goals for the Scott County School System. 
So my name is Tim Smith. I'm the moderator for tonight. And the number one was drawn by candidate Chris Shelton. So we'll begin with Mr. Shelton. And Mr. Shelton, this first uh, couple of minutes gives you an opportunity to give an opening statement about your candidacy. <coughs> well, thank you guys so much for um, extending the invitation. I think it's great. Um, this has been a wonderful process getting out in the community. Um, I've made a lot of friends and um, gained a lot of respect for anyone that kind of takes this venture on and, and runs for any office in particular. But uh, to, to introduce myself to those who I haven't gotten to meet yet, I would like to uh, start by just saying my name's Chris Shelton. Um, I'm married to Chelsea Sexton Shelton. She is a physician's assistant at Mountain Peoples. Um, some of her family members that you may know, um, her grandfather was Dick and Anna Rose Sexton out of Winfield, Henrietta Sexton DeBoard out of Huntsville, Tennessee, and Donnie and Amy Sexton are, are her parents. Um, I'm originally from Lincoln County. Um, I've been here long enough to uh, be in a couple weddings. Um, I graduated Maryville College in 2012 with a degree, a bachelor's degree in business and organizational management and have been in Scott County for right around 14 years. I attend White Rock Baptist Church um, and that's kind of what I'll leave right there. Okay, all right. Thank you, uh, Mr. Shelton. So we'll uh, turn our cameras now to a uh, candidate that drew number two and that is Mr. Curtis Bruce. He also a candidate for third district school board for Scott County School Board. Mr. Bruce, uh, your introduction comments. Well, I guess as a way of introduction, um, I'll say I've been here all my life. Uh, I've gone to, been a part of the Scott County School System for a lot of years. Uh, I think um, what I um, most want to say about myself is, is that you know, I have a lot of experience. I've worked for 20 years at Central Office. Uh, in that capacity, I was able to um, get my finger in just about everything that happened in the school system. Uh, I was assistant director, and as assistant director, I was uh, part of the responsibility was career and technical education director, maintenance uh, supervisor, transportation supervisor, and I've worked with budgets. I've uh, worked with the school system, school board from the other side of the table. Uh, so um, I, I think I don't have much of a learning curve uh, coming in, but um, that you know that's about where I am. All right, thank you, Mr. Bruce, and we we appreciate you both with those opening statements. Each question uh, gives a two minute time limit as we ask those here and since he went last on the first question we'll start with Mr. Bruce on the first question and that question is just simply why did you choose to run for a third district school board this is a, a seat without an incumbent so there's going to be a new representative for a third district on the Scott County School Board so Curtis Bruce why did you choose to run this year well I think uh, choosing to run for the school board uh, probably everybody has some uh, idea about the same thing. You want to work toward uh, providing the best possible education opportunity for children that you can. And uh, I guess beyond that, <laughs> I've, I've got a personal reason too in, in that, you know, after all these years in the school system, I miss being part of it. And, this give me an opportunity to do something that I haven't done before uh, and uh, another avenue into the school system, which, like I said, it's, it's been part of my life, my whole life. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. And uh, now for uh, Chris Shelton, the same question. Why did you choose to run for third district school board for Scott County? That's, a, that's an easy answer for me. Um, Throughout my career and just growing up, this is not a seat that I ever thought that I would, you know, go out and try to obtain. But when you have children, you, you realize pretty quickly that, you know, you're willing to do about anything and everything that you possibly can to, you know, to look out for their best interest. And so 
I have a, one daughter, her name's Hensley. She'll be in first grade at Huntsville Elementary um, next year. And then I've got another one that will be two next month. So I have kids that will be going through our school system over the next 15 years or so. And so after being involved and seeing kind of some of the needs that they had around uh, shape of the facilities, um, lack of opportunities as far as academic and athletic wise um, just really that's kind of at the core of this where it all started so um, that's kind of after a lot of praying a lot of soul searching and just realizing how long I've ingrained myself into this community and how many families actually knew me in our district um, and not just Chelsea and her family um, it, it kind of gave me some encouragement and you know it's like I said before this has been a great experience and I think a lot of people are excited to have someone, not, not so much younger, but just someone that has kids in the schools um, to kind of step out. And that's kind of where it all began for me. I, I couldn't look at my children and tell them I'm going to do everything and I possibly can to make sure that their experience throughout school is as good as it can be and look myself in the mirror and, and not do something about it. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. And, uh, We'll move on to question number two. And as I preface this with our second district candidate, school boards, uh, they do things well, and sometimes they do things that we don't agree with. And so that's with anything. We all, uh, none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes. We all uh, have victories in life. So what I wanna do first is focus on the positive. So uh, as best you can, talk to us about the, what you've seen the current school board do well, things that you wouldn't change because they've done a good job so far. And we'll start with Mr. Shelt. That's a great question. Um, I feel like the school board, I've, I've observed and been in tune with kind of what's happening since my daughter started school um, 18 months ago or so. And it's uh, obviously a position that you're put in where you're, you're gonna have to make tough decisions. Um, the, the things that I've seen um, from an investment standpoint with facilities, um, I think there's a lot of opportunities around that, but I think that how they spent the ESSER funds um, with the, uh, the buildings in particular, it, it does kind of portray the, the image that you wanna see as a parent, but there's still a lot of opportunities there. And then I think also, just being connected with the teachers. I've learned very quickly, we've got a lot of phenomenal teachers and they want nothing but the best for, for my children and all the children that are going through the school system. So I think that uh, that's something that in particular our school board like has done a nice job supporting them, but obviously there, there's still opportunities, which is why I'm doing this. All right, all right. thank you, Mr. Shelton. And, uh, Curtis Bruce will ask you the same question here, and that is the current board. Let's talk about what they've done, what you've seen them do in recent years. What, what are things you think they've done well that you just wouldn't change? Well, I think uh, knowing most of the school board members, I, th I think what they, they do is, is uh, listen to the public. Uh, you know, they're not gonna always please the public, I know that, but I think everyone there listens and and that's an important thing uh, I, I think they do like he said they do have their heart in the right place as far as kids are concerned you know that and they uh, um, you know they've they've had some tough decisions to make and, and you've got to work together and come together and compromise and and come to those decisions and and I, th I think that's what they do. I think they work together and, 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 and try to do what's best for the kids. And, but, and so, uh, and, I, and I think they, they're budget wise. I, I think they uh, look at, uh, they're using taxpayer money and I think they try to conserve that taxpayer money and spend it wisely. All right. All right, thank you, Mr. Bruce. Now, so we talk about the things that we think have been done well. Obviously, the flip side of that coin, uh, there are some things that we may think should have been done differently or could be done differently. So we'll start again with you, Mr. Bruce, on this first question. What are some things that you have seen that you think should have been done differently? 
I don't know that I can really uh, answer that question very well because uh, um, I, I don't want to criticize past decisions that they have made. Um, they, and just to be honest about it, I haven't kept that close to it until the last couple of months. You know, I, I know they've uh, talked about the football fields and the, you know the, the um, building, the playroom at the elementary school, that kind of thing, and wrestled with those. And, but uh, if they could do one thing better, uh, I, I think probably more public hearings on, on, on certain issues would be useful to them. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. And Mr. Shelton, uh, I'll pose to you the same question. Uh, the current board, are there some, some things that you've seen that you feel should be done, should have been done differently uh, in, in recent days? Yeah, so I'm, I'm like Curtis on that. Hind, we all know hindsight's 2020, um, and you know I'm, I'm the type of person where, when decisions are made, I want to consume as much information as possible so we can make an informed decision. And you know, thankfully, if elected, there will be six other you know board members that you can kind of discuss those and work your way and navigate through those things. So there's all types of ins and outs that affect those types of decisions. Um, one in particular that I noticed right away when my daughter started going to school at Huntsville was the playroom. Um, so kind of injected myself into that process and we ended up, long story short, being able to form a committee and have some influence on what the outcome of that's going to look like as far as, you know, going back and forth with the architect and um, the option that they have uh, presented to, to move forward to bid with, I think is a home run. And so after going through that process, they've kind of, obviously you've taken something that I feel like should have been completed, you know, years ago. But now that we are, we're getting it done. Hopefully we can get it across the finish line. Once it's done, I feel like it's obviously going to make a lot of people in the community, in the school system, um, you know, is very happy. And then also just uh, doing a little bit more digging as far as, you know, how far can we, you know, getting creative around our um, purchasing processes. If we're going to approach projects, do we need to go and approach to a and E firms first, architects and engineers, just different things like that are, you know, things that I've observed up to this point that I feel like, you know, I could bring and, you know, m be an asset to the board around. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. And uh, we'll alternate to the next question and you will lead on this one. You all are going to be a part uh, of a board that serves all of Scott County, but you live in the third district and you'll be the third district representative. So what are some exclusive concerns to the third district that you would like to see addressed and that you will bring to the board meetings? Yeah, I think that's uh, obviously, you know, and I've been very clear with the people in my district uh, in particular that I'm not going to be a board member that only cares about the schools in my district. I, I intend on meeting with every single principal in every single school um, if elected and, and being an advocate and doing as much as I can to pop um, to serve them, but um, to answer your question in particular around the concerns that I have, um, and initially I thought these were concerns that maybe I'm the only person that's you know seeing these things. But after being out talking to people, that's not the case. Um, you know, I, I feel like our buildings need you know some attention as far as enhancements, attention to details. Uh, you know, when you drive by, you want to, our community wants to see something that they're proud of. So. I've gone out, I've gotten quotes to, you know, um, what it would take to maintain the, the grounds at each school for six months. I've got a quote to paint the exterior doors and windows at Huntsville Elementary and Huntsville Middle for $6,000. I think that's a no-brainer. So I don't want to be a board member that just, you know, brings up problems and doesn't offer solutions. So I've already um, kind of done some due diligence and there's some things that, you know, if elected, I'd like to, to work on immediately with, with the other board members. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. We'll turn now to Curtis Bruce and Mr. Bruce. Uh, again, the question is about concerns that are exclusive to the third district as a representative if that's if you're elected to the board. 
Well, I think <laughs> the main concern right now, he's already mentioned that, is the playroom at Huntsville Elementary School. That's uh, a big budget issue and, and that kind of thing. But, but you know, I, I, <laughs> that's part of what I did when I was uh, working there in the school system as maintenance and, and those kinds of things. And, and that playroom, I wish it had been done 20 years ago. You know, it was always a fire marshal problem and that kind of thing. Uh, but uh, most of the things that the school board does not only affects the third district, it, it affects the whole school system. And, and as a board member, yeah, you represent the third district and, and you want to listen to your constituency and, and uh, uh, you know, always be available to answer questions and that kind of thing. But, but overall, the decisions are going to affect everybody. Um, you know, your main concern is always going to be, has to be how it affects the, the children. And then second to the children, your personnel. You know, you, you, uh, you've got to be a person that advocates for, for the children first, advocates for the, the personnel because you know, I was assistant director, like I said, uh, and it really didn't matter that much what I did if it didn't help the teacher in the classroom. That, that's where all, uh, and not just the teachers, you know, uh, your bus drivers, your custodians. You know, a lot of times a bus driver is the first person that a child sees. And I think back to that, you know, I remember every bus driver I, I ever had, I remember custodians, but I have sometimes a hard time uh, remembering some of my teachers. So, okay, my time's up. <laughs> All right, thank you, Mr. Bruce. I appreciate you. And, and you can continue if you want to take time away from this next question in this next segment, because you're leading on this one. So uh, in this question, I'm going to ask you to look into the future. So this is 2024. Should you be elected? on August the 1st as the uh, third district representatives of the Scott County School Board. When we hit 2028, what do you hope to say you see happen? Well, I'm going to answer that pretty simple. When I retired uh, a few years ago, uh, I, I told the school board, you know, I, I just hope I've been more of an asset that I have a liability. And I, I know I'm going to make mistakes and but I want to look back on it and say, yeah, I've I have been a positive input, uh, have some positive influence on the future of the Scott County Schools. Right. Thank you, Mr. Bruce and uh, Mr. Shelton. Same question goes to you. Uh, projecting out four years, should you be elected to this board? What do you hope to see? Yeah, that's a great question, and and I tell. I've told my constituents that if I have it my way, I will be so tired from working and, and getting stuff done that I don't, I won't want to seek reelection. But you know, as far as things that I've, I've identified as opportunities for our school system, you can go to my Facebook page and, and find some of this stuff. I don't have time to go through it, but there's a FEMA safe room opportunity that I, I feel like is not a pipe dream for our school system in particular. Um, that's something that I feel like would have impacts positive impact on generations of students and teachers and, and our community as well. As far as, um, you know, trying to identify grants that we can go out and obtain, obviously Oneida did that with the inclusive, uh, you know, playground that, that they're building out there, those types of things. And then also the um, rural arts facility fund. There's a, there's a grant out there where we, we can apply and, and obtain up to $200,000 in funding to kind of create um, and invest in a theater type environment. And, you know, as I evaluate opportunities that my kids are going to have throughout their experience with our school system, that, that's the kind of lens I'm looking through. So I certainly want to, to be one that's willing to roll up their sleeves, um, you know, put in the work and, and try to, you know, bring something that's tangible for our school system and our community. And, and also my children and all the children um, throughout the school system. All right, thank you, Mr. Shelton. Uh, next question you will lead on, and that is just about uh, how you would handle when you get a complaint uh, about the school system from someone in the community. 
uh, how would you handle a complaint situation? Yeah, I think that's um, something that obviously any board member is going to face and, and also just knowing the role of a, of a board member. You know, our, our job's hiring firing director and then adopting policies and budgets and serving as a community liaison. So, um, you know, I want to encourage any family or, you know, any parent, whatever, that, you know, absolutely reach out, but just know there is a chain of command and what we're able to do as far as being on the board is kind of limited um, in, in that capacity. But uh, I think the biggest thing, our, our parents want to be heard. And once they bring a concern um, to anyone associated with the school system that concerns their, their child, everything they care about the most, they want to they want to know a that it's being taken seriously and then it's being acted upon. So I think um, like my career in particular, just communication, communicating at a high level, following up, not letting stuff fall through the cracks um, would be something that as a parent I would expect and, and also appreciate from, from any board member. All right. Thank you, Mr. Shelton. And Mr. Bruce, the same question. Um, complaints can be made and, and how do you approach those? How would you handle those as a school board member? Well, as a school board member, he's already stated, you know, you you uh, there's a chain of command so but personally uh, you know I uh, what I was working was to give my door was the first door you walked into so so I've uh, heard a lot of complaints and people sometimes angry sometimes just uh, concerned about things but uh, what you have to do is listen you know sometimes that's all it takes to solve a problem is to listen and and uh, try to understand the other person's point of view. You treat everybody with respect and dignity, regardless of what the situation is. And uh, like I said, listen. And you know, um, if it's an issue that, that you need to take, uh, refer to the director of schools. Uh, but, you know, you can do that. But uh, you know, like I said, you, you're, uh, your responsibility is, is, or your duty, uh, sometimes there's not much you can personally do about that, but, but listen to them and, and try to uh, show them that you're concerned, that their concern is your concern, and, and uh, treat them like they, uh, like I said, with some, some respect and dignity. All right. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. Gentlemen, those are the final questions that I have. So we've reached the point where we're uh, making closing arguments. And the way I describe this is, it's your three minutes, your chance to make the final case to the folks out there that you should be the third district representative of the Scott County School Board. And again, by blind draw, uh, going first in this final round uh, will be Mr. Curtis Bruce. Well, you know, the, the voters are going to decide that, you know, what, uh, who they think is best qualified or, or will do the best job out there for them. And, but um, all, all I can say is that, you know, um, I have a lot of experience, I have a lot of knowledge that I think I can use as an asset. And I think I have the uh, ability to work with people uh, and and that that's what you have to do you, as a school board member, as I said, you'd have to have a re working relationship with them, and all the time realizing that that uh, it takes four to make, do anything. But I, I think that's uh, the way I would approach this. Is uh, and uh, and once again. Uh, by experience and, and who I am uh, is all I've got to sell. <laughs> all right. Thank you, Mr. Bruce. And now a uh, closing statement for Mr. Chris Shelton. Yes. Um, again, thank you. This has been a, a wonderful experience and I, I've enjoyed getting to, to, to meet and connect with so many people in our community. And, um, you know, the, the closing argument I would have um, this hasn't come up much in our community going door to door, um, but you know the the, the experience factor. Um, 
I work remote now. Prior to that, um, I spent seven years at a company called CentOS and um, was able to be an account manager for um, all different types of industries, but one that I, I kind of was fond of in particular were educational and government entities. So I was able to go out and um, work with superintendents, principals, maintenance, dietary directors, worked with Scott County, worked with Oneida, and through that experience was really able to get a unique perspective to where I was able to see what was top of mind for our surrounding school systems, the, the challenges, the opportunities that they were trying to, to work towards and address. And I feel like that really has qualified me. Obviously, I wouldn't do this if, it, if I didn't feel like I was qualified. So it, it does give me um, an advantage to come in and kind of be a fresh set of eyes for our school system. And we've all had situations in our life where we've benefited from having a fresh set of eyes in, in you know, a pro whatever problem or whatever we were trying to accomplish at that point. And, you know, the fact that I've had that unique experience and so many relationships that extend beyond our county lines, I feel like uh, will make me an asset um, to the board, but also being able to provide some additional oversight um, to our budget and, and ensuring that you've got someone that's going to go out and do the legwork and not always take information that's being told as kind of factual, but go out and kind of validate that on our own and, and kind of ensure that someone's always looking out for Scott County, um, whether that's being in a, a large project or something as simple as, you know, touching up a um, classroom. So th those are all things that kind of make me who I am. And as a parent, uh, you're going to have someone that's has a vested interest in our schools um, and wants obviously nothing but the you know success for for our school system in particular all right thank you gentlemen i want to thank mr curtis bruce mr chris shelton they are candidates for scott county school board for the third district and again the general election is august the first early voting is open right now we're going to take a bit of an extended break i want to i want to say to you that um, we had two ladies and two gentlemen who desire to serve scott county and uh, we appreciate them coming in and making their case that they should be the ones to do that. Coming up, we have five members or five folks that are vying for two slots on the Oneida Special School District Board of Education. So we're moving from interviewing one and one to two to then five. We're going to have to do a little bit of rearranging. So what I'm saying to you is give us just a few more minutes as we take this break. And when we return, we'll have the final segment of our candidate forum. It will be those vying for the Oneida Special School District Board of Education, and that's coming up next. Welcome back to the Independent Herald Candidate Forum. I'm Tim Smith. I'm your moderator for this evening. We now turn our attention to the Oneida Special School District. Before we do that, I do want to thank Oneida Mayor Lori Phillips-Jones for the use of the facilities here at the Oneida Municipal Building, and I want to thank all five candidates. We have two open or two seats open for Oneida Special School District Board of Education for the August 1st general election and early voting is open now. We have five candidates vying for those two seats. There are two incumbents among the field and three challengers and you're going to get a chance to hear from all of them here tonight as they look to serve you for the next four years on the Oneida Special School Board. If you know someone that would like to watch this and you want to tell them how they can see the Independent Herald Candidate Forum. You can find us on the Independent Herald Facebook page. We are also on YouTube on the Independent Herald YouTube channel, the IHSN channel, the South Fork Network channel. We're also on Twitch on the South Fork Network. And we're on Highland Media Channel 190, which is the South Fork Network. So we appreciate you joining us this evening. And most of all, we appreciate the five candidates agreeing to come and talk to us here tonight about their candidacy for Oneida Special School District Board of Education. Prior to the beginning of tonight, uh, two things I want to tell you. One, it is warm in the room, and uh, you need to keep that in mind for these folks. Uh, we, we appreciate them being here, but it is a little bit toasty in here, so uh, I apologize for that. Wish we could have could have affected that a little bit better, but they're sticking it out. They're tough people and they're here for us tonight. Uh, I also uh, want to tell you that we drew for order tonight. 
So they drew numbers one through five. And number one will lead with opening statements, and number five will lead with closing statements. Opening statements and all questions in between will be a two minute time limit. Closing statements will be three minutes, and for the purpose of addressing something that maybe a question wasn't asked about that the candidate wants to share and make their closing argument on why they should be an Oneida Special School District Board of Education representative. With those parameters being set out, uh, we welcome you to the candidate forum, and we welcome our first candidate who drew number one. And so going first for the uh, opening section here tonight, it is Dr. Danny Cross. Well, I thank you for having us, first of all. I appreciate it. And I appreciate the years, and I have been on the board a long time. And I realize that, and I've enjoyed every bit of it. And I just appreciate the fact that I can uh, do this for my community, for our children in our community, and the public school, schools in our community. And I initially, I felt that uh, when I first thought about being on the board, I, I thought it was my duty. I think it's every citizen in the community, it's their duty to serve on our public schools if we can. I mean, if you want to, and I did want to, I wanted to be close to the, to the school system again. And I, uh, I just loved every minute. I like being around good people. And I think being around good people, you can see by the people that are candidates, we've got good people that are wanting to be on the board also. It promotes that. And I'm just proud of the fact, and it's just such an honor to serve our community on the, on the Oneida Special School District School Board all these years now. And I guess that's as much of a statement I can make to begin with, and I thank you for it. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And drawing number two for the opening statement tonight, Dr. Nancy Williamson. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. Uh, Danny and I came on the board together, and we've had a wonderful, wonderful relationship and have worked together very well. The reason I wanted to be on the board was, here again, I felt like it was my duty to serve. And I had been teaching in the, in the system, had the opportunity to move on to the University of Tennessee and work with the Rural Teacher Education Program, which Tim Smith was a part of during that time. And from there, it's just kind of blossomed. I got very involved in TSBA, uh, served as president, uh, did a lot of traveling with that position. I've gone through the whole process in the school board. And I, I want to make sure that our students whether they're in the Oneida schools or in the county schools, have the best opportunity that they can have to succeed. I graduated in 1961, went to college, and have earned three degrees. And I, I came from Oneida, I came back to Oneida to try to ensure that all the students, no matter where they are, will have the same opportunity. I enjoy uh, working with students, and I still teach a class at Roan State every fall. I do that just to keep up with the students and with the issues that they have with our schools right now. And it's not the schools, it's all the mandates from the state. I stay in contact with the legislators, I let them know my thoughts on issues, and they usually listen sometimes. But uh, it is a pleasure to serve on the school board and stay current on any any issue that happens to come up before uh, our board. All right. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. And again, uh, you may be thinking at home, that, that's rigged. They had the two incumbents go first. I promise you it was a blind draw. All the candidates can tell you that. It just worked out that way, but we do have our two incumbents now. And now we have our first challenger. And for opening statement, it'll be Mr. Cody Pike. Hi, everyone. I want to thank you for taking the time to hear me out and hear what I have to say about everything. Um, kind of like the, the predecessors before me said, um, I have a love for this community. Um, I consider myself to have a servant's heart. Um, uh, I'm a product of Oneida High School. Um, I'm a product of both its successes and its failures. I've had plenty of my time, but through the education that I was given, I was able to fight back and achieve where I am today. And that's kind of what I'm hoping to come back and provide some of the new insight into how things have changed. Because you know, over the last you know, 30 years, 
our world has changed. It's entirely different. Um, I, my goal is, is that hopefully I want to be able to produce students that are coming out here and being able to be productive, caring, helpful members of our, of our society. And hopefully we can pass down that servant's heart to them and be able to get them out here and have more people to continue to remain in Scott County to continue to make this the great place that we all know that it is. All right, thank you, Cody. And we'll move on to another challenger for the school board race, and that's Missy Sexton. Missy, uh, your opening statement. Um, I'm Missy Sexton. Um, I, I agree with everything that has been said. Um, there's not really nothing that I would bash. Uh, I think that the parents and the students trust me to be their voice. Um, and as a parent of a high school student that has went through Oneida, and I went through Oneida, um, I just want to make it as great as what it, is, what it can be. And I think that all of us together, we could do that. All right, thank you, Missy. And then finally, uh, uh, one of the challengers, a former board member, and that's Mr. Stuart Jones. Stuart, you have two minutes. Thank you, Tim. Thank you to the Independent Herald and Southport Networks for putting this on. I am Stuart Jones. I am Republican nominee for this school board. Um, I, I, first and foremost, I'm a Christian, unashamedly. Um, I'm a child of the King. Um, I'm also a husband. Uh, my wife, Crystal, has served 25 years at Oneida Elementary uh, in various roles as teacher, in both fourth grade and, and pre-K uh, pre teacher the last couple of years. Um, I'm a dad of a graduate, a recent graduate of Oneida High School in, in Madison Jones. And I've got an eighth grade son, uh, Camden. Uh, he'll be in eighth grade, of course, this year. Uh, very proud uh, Oneida alumnus myself, class of 1996. Very proud to have the opportunity to serve. I was appointed uh, to serve an unexpired term in 2020, and um, I served that for two years. Um, very proud of my time on the board. Uh, I felt like I, I was a help to the board. I felt like I asked uh, the right questions. I felt like I got some answers. And uh, anyway, I really enjoyed my time with the board and being a servant first and foremost, first and foremost to the, uh, to the kids, uh, all 1,300 plus kids in the Oneida Special School District, uh, there are kids. You know, if you pay taxes uh, in the Oneida School District, they're your kids too. So it, their future matters to all of us. Um, so I really, like I said, enjoy my time. I'm proud of Oneida. I'm proud to be an Oneida Indian uh, through and through. I always have been. And I want to make, I want to help to shape the future of what Oneida schools will continue to be into the future. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stuart Jones. And that concludes the opening statements for each candidate. Uh, by draw, uh, they went in an order, and we'll continue to start with the person who was second in line. Uh, so that means for this first question, it's going to be Dr. Nancy Williamson. And so this is kind of a different question for two people and for the other three people, because the question is, as an incumbent, why stay the course? So what, what would be the case you would make for why people should stay the course and keep you on the Oneida School Board as an incumbent? Even though I've been on the board now 20 years, that doesn't mean I'm not in touch with what's going on in education locally, statewide, and nation nationally. I'm concerned about some of the issues that we're having to face, uh, and I feel like I have the background knowledge and the connections to continue to advocate for our students. I want to see us continue to prosper and to continue to offer the, the programs that we've got. Uh, we've implemented many new uh, programs and my priorities are academics, athletics, and the arts. And we are, we're moving up. I've seen band reintroduced at the elementary school and music. That's very important. I've seen our band uh, develop into a very, very competitive program that they have now. And also, I'm, I'm aware of some of the issues that are going on that we're going to have to face in the next four to five years. And I feel like with my background in education, my knowledge of education, of education issues, and how they operate, 
that I can continue to be a very effective board member uh, for the next four years and advocate for our teachers and our students. All right, thank you, Dr. Williamson. And then the question would be, Cody Pike, you're next. And Cody is one of the challengers. Uh, and so, Cody, the question to you would be, why is it time for a change on the Oneida School Board? I don't necessarily think that we need to come in and just completely unroll everything that we've been working on. Our school has been doing a tremendous job of growth and everything else that's going on. I just feel that it's time because to have a, essentially a fresh set of eyes come in, come in from a, a from a different background. Let's make sure that we're hitting all the all the high points. You know, um, like I said earlier, you know, I've had my fair share of uh, failures and successes. I have friends who are, went to schools all across all across the state, and thankfully I have the ability to talk to them and see how some of those schools are doing certain things and. I've learned through these conversations that we're missing in certain areas. Um, hopefully, if elected, I'll be able to have a little more access to the specific procedures and policies and everything on the day-to-day -day ground basis to kind of help formulate and mold what we've already got into something better. All right, thank you, Cody. And uh, we'll continue on. Missy Sexton, also a challenger. So Missy, it would be the same question. Why do you feel like it's time for a change on the Oneida School Board? Um, I believe that the policies are there. Um, I believe there's you know, some questions about implementation that has been brought to my attention that I've seen myself. As a parent, talking to parents, the stuff that our kids are going through in, you know, that are related to school and that is related to their future directly, some of that's not being addressed. And I, I feel that I, I mean, I could work on the board and like Cody said, be a fresh set of eyes from a different perspective of what is sitting at the sidelines at these football games and the parents that are, are really struggling at home that are coming to me. And I think I could be that, that voice of reason for them. Thank you, Missy Sexton. And uh, the final challenger to speak in this round, and that's Stuart Jones. So Stuart, the question again, why is it time for a change on the Oneida School Board? Tim, I believe it's time for a change because as I've made my rounds and began to talk to people, there are some things that need, need to be addressed. But you know, Oneida's a great place to you know, raise a family uh, and, and have kids put through ed public education. You know, if you're gonna be publicly educated, where else but, but Oneida. But I believe it's time, time for a change because, you know, we, we need a new, new set of ears, a new fresh set of eyes, and I believe I provide that change. I've got my ear to the ground because, like I said, I've got a kid in school. I don't believe currently we have any board members who have a child in our school system. Is that important? Absolutely. You know, he gets to tell me what's going on at school every single day. Like I said, I've been married to Crystal for 25 years, she can tell me from a teacher's perspective, you know, what we need more of, what we maybe need less of. I'm sure she's probably going to kill me through throwing her under the bus on that one, but, but it does. It kind of gives me a little different perspective. You know, you'll find me at every Oneida basketball, football game, soccer game. I'm the voice of Jane Terry Hoffman Field. Donate my time for that. Uh, through my work with the Independent Herald Sports Network as well, I love, to, uh, I love to attend those games and be a part of that as well. So, like I said, I'm Oneida through and through. Uh, my day job, you know, I do work in public education myself. I work in McCreary County School District, a neighboring school district. I work in the IT department. So I'm able to help both students and teachers and staff members with new software, uh, new hardware systems, new computers, anything they need. And I, I've really got my ear to the ground on that one. I know what we need in our schools and I know uh, I, I'm able to help implement more of that in the future because really that's what we're going to. Even in public education settings, that's, that's what we're going to be moving more toward. We're already there, but we're going to see an increase in that, no doubt. Thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Jones. And our final uh, speaker on this, we'll, we'll circle back around to Dr. Danny Cross. And Dr. Cross is an incumbent. So back to the question for the incumbent, why stay the course with the current school board? Well, 20 years gives you some something to look back on as experience you see what's going right and what's going wrong i think that 
I don't think anyone's, there's not any one perfect in this world at this time. So I've never felt like I had any endowed with any particular skill set that allowed me to be a good school board member other than my heart. I feel like I think as a conservative and as an objective thinker, I like to look at the facts, not just how I feel about things. It's not how I feel, it's how the community feels about it and how, how best we can do what's best for our children. You know, our sole purpose is, uh, as a school board members is to oversee the public education of our students in this community. And that's why I take that to heart. I've taken, taken it to heart in my military experience, everything, and, and in uh, being a deacon in the church. I just, it's just something you, I take uh, at, to heart, and I, I just love it. I love being a part of it, uh, holding out of schools. I love being a part of school, the school system. And it's just something, I, and that's why I'm here again. I love it, and I just cannot just give it up. I'll be glad to give it up, you know, in the election, that's fine, but I can't just give it up because I've been here for 20 years. Uh, I enjoy it more. It's just a joy to be uh, on out of Indian. And I'm thankful for the opportunity. All right, thank you, Dr. Cross. Uh, we'll move on to the next question and we'll have a, a new person going first. That's gonna be Cody Pike's turn to go first in this one. And as I introduced this earlier in the uh, Scott County School Board Members Race, just a reminder, I, you know, we all self-analyze and we're, we're self-critical about everything. I know that I have strengths, I know that I have weaknesses. So I'm gonna ask for your analysis first the first question that Cody will answer first is what's something the current board or things that the current board you feel has done well? I feel that they've done a really good job of bringing in some of the new um, procedures and stuff that's going like, I guess, academic stuff that's going on in the school. Uh, you know, I've heard that they're working on an agricultural program to get kids more involved in that. You know, they've worked to secure multiple grants to make sure that we have the money and the funding to do the things that we need to do. There's several really good things that are there that's, that's being done, and I appreciate all the hard work that they've done to do that. So I would definitely say that they're making sure that our funding and trying to expand the programs that we have access to. All right, thank you, Cody. Uh, next question, or same question uh, to our next uh, challenger and that will be to Missy Sexton. The question is, what has the current board done well for Oneida Schools? Um, overall, I think they have done really well with laying the policies down, bringing the new laws. The laws are constantly changing with education and they, I think they have done really well keeping up with those changes. You know, we've got a whole laundry list that just came down and it'll be coming in to effect July 1st, or it just went into effect July 1st for this school year. And, you know, they are, they are on top of that part. And I really appreciate their hard work on that. All right, thank you, Missy. And then finally, Stuart Jones. Stuart, uh, this, this Oneida board, what are some things that you feel like they have done well? In a word, facilities. Our facilities are second to none. I realized that in my two years serving on the board that uh, now 30-year-old buildings at Oneida Elementary, Oneida Middle and High School, our football field, Dr. Emmy Thompson Field at Jim May Stadium, now our soccer field, uh, we're seeing new sod being bid out for that. Two years ago when I was on the board, we saw use of ESSER funds to start a gym project behind Oneida Elementary because quite frankly, that school was busting at the seams with over 800 kids. Uh, so we are, but the facilities look great. You know, I've, I've been in several, through my role in work and before, I, I've seen several different school buildings in our county and otherwise too. And really, they're beyond compare. They're very well taken care of. That's a credit to our administration, uh, board, as a credit to our staff who maintains those, puts real heart share into those every single day. So I wanted to see that continue. 30-year-old uh, buildings, they look great and beyond. So we're, we're so proud to see the, the new expansion in the gym as well. Uh, but Absolutely. In a word, our facilities are something that's been very well taken care of. All right. Thank you, Stuart Jones. And now we'll turn to Dr. Danny Cross. Dr. Cross, the question is, what are the things you're most proud of 
the board you've been a part of has been able to accomplish for Oneida schools? Well, I think, you know, obviously the things that have already been mentioned, that's the most obvious things, our facilities are really, I like to say, second to none. They still look good. And the main thing, I think, is the pride that you see. You know, we've always talked about Oneida pride. And I've got the opportunity. We've got people at every level. They take such great pride in this. Our teachers, our staff, uh, our janitors, everyone, they, they, they love it. Uh, they, uh, they take care of these facilities, and I think our students, in turn, they take care of it too as best they can. And I, uh, that is not something that just happens. That has to be fostered, and I think we've got an administration who do, do that. And I think uh, uh, it's, uh, that's something that the public can see immediately, that there is pride in our system and there's pride in our educational system and, and our students, and I think they show it. Things are on the rise again after COVID. We have to always consider there was a lull in education all over. And uh, some of the things we see or we may see as negatives can now be seen as positive because we're emerging from that. And that's all over. Not just in Oneida, but I think Oneida has, has done an excellent job in coming out of that. Okay. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And uh, the final question answer of this round will be Dr. Nancy Williamson. Again, the, the question, Dr. Williamson, the current board that you have been on, what are the things that you're most proud of? Well, I've already mentioned one, and that is reestablishing music and band at the elementary school. Uh, again, our facilities... I talked to people from all around and they, they're just amazed that those buildings are over 30 years old. We take great pride in it. Like everybody said, the students take care of it. I'm also very pleased with some of the new programs that we've started, especially the agri-science program because the students need this type of work in this area. We have other issues and, and programs that we're working on at this time that will bring even more uh, academic success to our students. The Ayers Foundation is amazing. It was started last year and it gives students the opportunity to visit college campuses. We have a counselor and we don't even do Tennessee Promise mentoring anymore because it's taken care of through this Ayers Foundation. The athletic facilities, I've never seen them better. Uh, that's one thing, I'm former wife of a coach. My late husband was a, a coach at Oneida. He loved Oneida. And when he moved up here, his mother said, I knew when he came here, he'd never leave. And that's kind of the feeling I have. I came back here in 65 to teach, and I've been here ever since. But I'm very proud of the pride that everybody takes in our total system, not just the facilities, but in the academic program and in the career and technical program. All right, thank you, Dr. Williamson. And uh, we will have one more question, then we'll take a short break uh, for all those involved. So this question, obviously the opposite side of the coin, it's uh, Missy Sexton's turn to go first on this one. So Missy, we talked about what the current board has done well. Uh, what do you feel like the current board should have done differently? Um, they're coming as a parent, and um, that's why I, I keep saying, you know, I hear the other side and like Stuart mentioned, you know, there's nobody with a, with a student on that board and they don't hear the, what the students go through every day. And I think that the parents and the students, from what I've been told, they feel like they're not heard. And they feel like there is so much more that could be done to involve them in the education of their children. And that, that's just repeated what I, I mean, what I hear over and over is that the parents just don't feel heard and neither do the students. 
All right, thank you, Candidate Sexton. And now, uh, Stuart Jones. Stuart, the same <coughs> question. Uh, you've talked about strengths of the board. What are some things that you, you think should have been done differently? I can think of a couple of things. Um, when I look back on it, I mentioned our facilities are awesome, but I think maybe we could have done a little better job years back in planning for um, what is now a busting at the seams Oneida Elementary School. Uh, maybe you could have expanded that a little sooner where we're not caught uh, really just with no room and no, nowhere to place our, our paraprofessionals, uh, our educators um, in a setting that is not really conductive education if you need some one-on-one -on -one spaces. They're, you know, they're just really tightly packed in into that elementary school. So maybe looking back in years past, that could have been addressed a little sooner. Uh, I think some of that will be addressed as we move forward when the, with the uh, completion of the gymnasium project. Uh, that will allow a little more space there uh, as well. Uh, but another thing I'd like to see, and I don't think it's exclusive uh, to Oneida, but Missy's already mentioned, you know, having a voice, uh, you know, for, for parents to go to. But one thing I keep hearing when I'm out and about is, you know, there's, it's not exclusive to Oneida, but really get a handle on the bullying situation. I think kids um, are bullied for one reason or another, and that happens all across the country. But what can we do? Uh, to address that situation where kids, I feel like there's you know, safe at school, but still there's opportunity there for, for kids to be kids and, uh, and do some things that, that's not really conducive to education in, in our buildings. So let's, let's make sure we're, we're, we're not turning a deaf ear to that, we're listening to that, and we're addressing those situations, and maybe that stops up, starts up top with maybe some new policies or maybe some just new uh, reinforcement of some old ones. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stuart. And then we'll turn to Dr. Danny Cross. And Dr. Cross, in looking back at the years, you talked about the strengths you feel like the board has presented. What have been some challenges, maybe a swing and a miss, some things you wish had, had been done differently? Well, <clears throat> my feeling not like being a board. I'm only one-fifth of the board, so I cannot, you know, speak to whatever could be go on. And not, not that my ideas are best. Uh, always, but I th think sometimes just as board, you know, we we can work sometimes better together. But that's not doesn't mean in any way that I don't have respect for every board member. And we all have our own opinions. And like Stuart says, we are we have had struggle with with maybe looking out in the future how. But that's more difficult than it is to say about how much our seams are going to burst. Uh, uh, you just can't always plan on, you know, student, new students coming into the system. And we know, as a board and as a school system, we're kind of landlocked, and there's not, they're not making any more of it around our and so, uh, area that our schools are located. So it's, it's a challenge. It is a challenge. Maybe we're not meeting the challenge as much maybe as we to look at that, but I do think that our administrators are thinking about it all the time. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's on our minds. It's not like that's something new that's come before the board about or being landlocked. And, and in the future, we're going to have to meet the uh, uh, high school needs, uh, elementary school at this point right now. It's a, but that, as that gym project is finished, that will relieve it for a while, but that's not going to be the end of it. It's going to continue. And... Uh, so that probably is true, right? but it's not as easy answered as it is to, you might think. <laughs> All right, thank you, Dr. Cross. And uh, Dr. Nancy Williamson, the question, what should have been done differently or could have been done differently by the board? By this board, we inherited some things from former boards. Uh, and it's already been mentioned, we are landlocked. And that's why anytime property is available, we need to buy it. Now the next step is, how do we do it with our limited funds? And in order for the, the Oneida Special School District to even get a loan, we have to go through the legislature. So it's something that has been on everybody's mind since we even started the building project. And of course, limited funds there made it uh, smaller than it should have been. Those buildings have been added on to, I've lost count four or five times. 
the high schools had an addition, the middle school had an addition, the elementaries had two additions, and still uh, we're bursting at the seams. So it's something that you think you plan for and you try to plan for, and there are specific uh, growth formulas that you can use, but they are always not that accurate. Uh, but that's something that we have to keep in the forefront is where do we go from here? Do we add on to a building? Do we try to build a whole new building? What's going to be the best for the students? What's going to be best for the community? And looking at what's already there. You've got your high school with the football stadium. You don't want to go somewhere and try to, to do a whole new high school. And same with the middle school. So these are issues that we have to take seriously. We have to look at, we have to research and look at what some other schools have done. And there's not too many creative things out there that I've seen. It's just buckle down, find the funds, and do some additions. All right, thank you, Dr. Williamson. <coughs> and uh, finally on this question will be Cody Pike. And Cody, the question again is, what should this board have done differently? I don't think there's any one specific thing that, you know, that's been done terribly. But, um, and I understand that there's the issues that they discussed with the, the being landlocked, the, the growth, the issues that we have there. However, from another standpoint, I believe we do need to do a better job of looking inside. I've heard concerns of uh, teacher retention. You know, years ago, um, the, the infamous Miss Brewster, um, we don't have teachers like that anymore. We need teachers who are Onada. They're here, they know us, they know what's going on. Um, next up, uh, I've heard some concerns of nepotism and the ability for the community to actually have access to the board members. Um, you know, that's, this is the, the board's job. Our job is to be the liaison between the director, the schools, and the community. And I think that, you know, one of my personal things that I think that could have been done better and that I would work on is increasing that open accessibility to everyone and trying to make sure that, you know, our teachers are being empowered to teach and creating a school that people want to come work for because people that want to come work here, they're going to help us do those things. They're going to help us work to achieve the necessary means through grants or whatever it may be to get the resources that we need to make Onada great again. Thank you, Cody. And so that concludes the first half of our candidate forum for the Oneida Special School District Board of Education uh, challengers and incumbents. We're going to take a quick break for them and for myself and for you all. And uh, we'll tell you we'll be back in just a few minutes with the second half of our candidate forum here on the IH Network. Welcome back to the Independent Herald Candidate Forum. We are in our second part with the Oneida Special School District Board Candidates. That's the word I was looking for. So that's what we're gonna do. We've continued down the line uh, we, through questions and opening statements, and we're gonna have a few more questions and then closing statements here in this final segment. Uh, we are rotating who goes first each time, and we're to Stuart Jones. Uh, Stuart Jones is a challenger here tonight, and Stuart mentioned in his opening that he was a Republican candidate for the office. And so uh, this is the first year of uh, this being done in the state of Tennessee. I think it's going to be for all candidates uh, for in the future. Some chose to enter the Republican primary. Some chose to go as independent. And I would just ask the question, beginning with Stuart, why you chose to go as a Republican candidate for school board. Well, Tim, that didn't come without a great bit of, of deciding on that one. I went back and forth before I elected to pick up, uh, knowing I had to make that decision. Uh, the easy thought was just to pick up as an independent and go straight to the general election on August 1st. But I am who I am by the grace of God, and I am red-blooded American through and through. Um, you know, I, I align much more with with those who believe conservatively like I do. And uh, so I decided to pick up. You know, 86% of Scott County voted for uh, Donald Trump in the last election. I, I, I really expect that to be a little higher this time around. And uh, anyway, I didn't want to hide who I am. Uh, I don't believe in hiding who I am. It would have been very easy for me to just say, independent, don't worry about it, it doesn't matter. But when given a choice, you've got to stick to who you are. And that's what I decided to do. I'm Republican, unashamedly, that's who I am, a conservative. 
Thank you. All right, thank you, Stuart Jones. And so the question then would turn to uh, Dr. Danny Cross. Dr. Cross, uh, you ran as an independent uh, for school board, and I'm just asking about that I decision. Did, I think uh, Stuart hit the nail on the head. I did it because I didn't see the uh, having to go through a, a primary in the spring. Independence, I am conservative. I, I like to say I'm an objective thinker, but I guess truly, okay. Sorry. I can say that I really, I, I'm a Republican, I guess, but I'm really an independent. I just don't want, I'm going to go for who I think is the best candidate. If that happens, to, and most of the time now, it's always the Republican, but if there was somebody that I thought was better than that particular candidate, I wouldn't. I wouldn't go there, but it'll always, almost always be conservative. I just think whoever's the best, and that's for any position, that matter, the best candidate needs to be the one in that position, because I would hate to think about like having a military that we didn't have our best people in. And I think right now we're have, we've got a military sometimes that we don't have our best people in there. It's because they fill a particular niche, and I think we need our best people no matter where it's at. So, but I am a, truly a conservative and always will be. I can't be any other way, but uh, uh, that's why I okay. All right. just didn't want to go be primary. And Dr. Cross, uh, we did have a slight glitch during your, so <laughs> I hope we didn't throw you off, but I will offer you extra time if you didn't get the complete answer that you wanted to get out No, there. I was, you know, I was, I agree with Stuart. He, he's, he's, He's uh, not on his, what, the way he believes. I, I, and I believe, you know, with all my heart that I am a conservative. And if that fits, uh, and the most always it is, it's probably a Republican. Uh, but I guess, in truth, I'm an independent in myself because I believe in voting whoever's the most qualified all right. for the position that we're trying. That's why I chose that at this time. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cross. We'll take a quick break to fix a technical issue and pick right back up with Dr. Williamson on this question in just a moment. All right, welcome back, folks. Thank you for staying with us through a quick glitch and uh, apologize to the candidates for that. We will now turn to Dr. Nancy Williamson. Uh, we have the question on the floor now about declaring for a, uh, a party. Uh, it's a new thing in Tennessee, and so you ran as an independent for school board and just discuss that de decision with us. Okay, I really classify myself as an independent because, here again, I vote for the person and not particularly the party. Uh, I do vote Republican a big part of the time, but that doesn't mean that a, for a school board, it is a local decision-making body. And I told our representatives when this became uh, an issue, I said, if I have to declare a party, I won't run anymore because I don't think it's appropriate for local school board members. You're here to serve the general public. And as an independent, I feel like that I can see both sides. And I always have. I always try to say, okay, this is the issue. This is the issue. Now, what do we need to do to bring it together? And, and I, I'm, like I said, I'm a, a true independent and vote in Republican primaries and occasionally in a Democratic primary. It depends on uh, who's running and what the issues are. All right. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. And the question continues about declaring. Cody Pike is next. Cody, you declared as an independent uh, for this race. Just explain that decision for us. I did. Um, personally, it was going to be the easiest option to get on the ballot. However, from a personal standpoint, I truly believe that the only place politics des deserves to play a role in the school system is learning about them. Um, you know, we all come on this board and it should not matter how we feel left, right. Um, our decisions should be made, be made in the best interest of our children and it shouldn't matter your own political opinion. All of that stuff should be left at the door, especially in the, today's world where everything is, is honestly just gone crazy. 
um, you know, this is this is our youth we're talking about, and we need to take the extremism of having to pick a side out of it, and we just need to be doing what's best for our kids. And it's kind of hard to put that on paper of which way you want to go with it. So uh, independent just seemed like the simple choice to make. You know, from a personal standpoint, um, like everybody else here said, I do have conservative values. I do believe, you know, in the Bible and church and, and all of that, but I believe we should be making decisions on children's education and their futures from a neutral standpoint. Thank you, Cody Pike. And uh, Missy Sexton is our final answer of this question. Missy declared as a Republican uh, here in this first year where there, the, the declarations were made. So if you would just explain that decision to us. Um, I declared as Republican because um, that is me. And um, like Stuart said, you know, I've been straight up with everybody. You know, that is, that's me. Um, I do agree with Cody that politics shouldn't play a part in our schools. Um, but I wanted people to know that I am a Republican, that I am, I do have conservative values. I do, I was raised conservative, I vote conservative. Um, but that was, there, there was no hesitation because I wanted the parents, the students, everybody that was voting to know where I stood on that. Thank you, Missy. So that concludes that question for this round, and, and it will now be back to Dr. Danny Cross to answer first on this next question. So Dr. Cross, the next question, uh, as a serving school board member, um, and, and for those that are uh, want to be on the school board, there are gonna be things that keep you up at night as a school board member, as a, as a uh, participant in education. And those things can, can range from vouchers to homeschooling, to funding, to safety. And I would just ask what you feel like the challenges of the next four years for the Oneida Special School District are going to be. Well, I think you get the nail on one of the real thing not for our district and all districts in the state of Tennessee is how we approach vouchers, charter schools, uh, private schools. I um, mean, we, we can't just exclude private schools because that's where a lot of vouchers are going to go. And, uh, you know, I, uh, you have to realize that there are reason people that will favor those things because there are taxpayers who who pay taxes all the time, but they have their children in private schools. So what goes with that tax dollar uh, for them? So they're going to look at that in a many, much different way. But we in the Oneida Special School District, we know we're a public education system. And I just cannot see where uh, there is a benefit to favoring vouchers in in our system because we're a public system because it would, it would take a take away from our children if they're, if, and we know there's gonna be uh, some selfishness that will go on. Uh, there'll be uh, this amount of money that we have coming in uh, due to our uh, attendance. You know, and that, don't, don't, that does not amount to as much as people may think it does sometimes per student. Because uh, I've looked some in that in the past. It's a very, it, it varies. Uh, so I think that may be one of the biggest things face, facing us in the near future is that because that's going to come up again uh, and it'll, it'll come up every year, I guess. And we just have to face that as best we can in Scott County and Oneida Special School District. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And uh, next will be Dr. Nancy Williamson. And I work for the state, so let me clean up my question just a little bit. Uh, issues like vouchers or school choice, uh, because there's two different ways to say that. Uh, so I want to be clear about what I'm talking about. Homeschooling, funding, safety. What are the things that as a board member you see the next four years are going to be the big challenge for not a special school district? The, the thing about vouchers it may not it will affect the funding uh, and my stand is and this is where the legislature won't agree if you're going to give public money public taxpayer money to private schools then they need to have to follow the same guidelines the same testing uh, pro protocol that we do 
but they are given the money with no strings attached, just their own accountability, while we have to follow all the state and federal guidelines. And then another thing, the universal vouchers, where they are given to anybody, regardless of income, to send their child to the public, to the private school. So is it fair that they're taking money from us on public schools and giving it to people who are, have a very, very high income and, st and sending their students to a private school? Uh, this has been a push for many years. I've been going back reading some history uh, about funding and different things. And this started many, many years ago. And it's coming out again because of your uh, out-of-state wealthy donors that are pushing for these vouchers. If it were administered fairly, probably wouldn't have a problem with it. But if the schools have to follow the same guidelines that we do, you'd see a, a big de decrease in the push for vouchers. <coughs> Thank you, Dr. Williamson. We'll continue down the line. The question uh, for Cody Pike, once again, the question, Cody, is these challenges such as vouchers or school choice, homeschooling, funding, safety, what do you see as the big challenges the next four years for the Oneida Special School District? I'm not super up to date on all of the concerns and everything that everybody has. Um, I know that that might sound like a weak answer, but it is something that I can say that if elected, it is something that I will find answers on. We need to know exactly what's going on. You know, this is where one of those times that maybe having a beneficial second set of eyes that's not used to this information, I can come in and read these and kind of help determine some of the better courses that need to be taken or some possible other actions that, that need to be occurring that are not occurring. Uh, you mentioned earlier about um, laying your head down to sleep and having thoughts and decisions on your mind. Um, I will say that that's at least one field that I feel very comfortable in, um, working in healthcare. Every single decision I make truly affects somebody's life for the positive or the negative. So I do not make decisions lightly. I look at the holistic whole approach and that will not change whether I'm making a decision on how we should treat someone in healthcare or what decision we should make that's gonna affect your child. Um, you know, if I've, had the, if I've had the blessing of taking care of you as a patient, you know that I tell everybody that I treat my patients like they're on my own family in this role, I'm going to treat every child as if they're my own child too, because in one to two short years, it will be my child. And I feel that, you know, coming in and being open-minded to find answers to these problems is going to be one of the best things that we can do. All right. Thank you, Cody Pike. And then the question to Missy Sexton. Missy, the question again is uh, vouchers, school choice, homeschooling, funding, safety, even doesn't have to be something I've mentioned, but what do you feel like are the challenges for the Oneida Special School District in the next four years? Um, I think if we don't get our, our kids and the parents, they don't feel safe. Um, from the bullying to the threats, they, it's got to stop. We, somebody has to step up for our kids. And I hear this repetitive people, parents coming to me that, and you know, as a parent, I've laid awake at night worried about my kid going to school the next day. And that shouldn't be an issue. The, it's, it's there, it can be implemented. It just needs to be implemented. Our kids need to, and our parents need to be able to be okay if they do hear something happens at that school. But right now they're not. Our parents and our students are scared to death. And that is something that needs to be addressed immediately. Thank you, Missy. And finally, Stuart Jones. Stuart, the question again, uh, vouchers are school choice, homeschooling, funding, safety. What are the challenges that you feel the Oneida Special School District is facing in the next four years? Well, Tim, public education, not only in Tennessee, not only in Oneida, but across the nation, 
it weighs in the balance right now. It's in the hands of our legislators in Nashville, ultimately in Washington as well. We need people who are willing to go to bat. We need people who are willing to stand up for our kids and go to bat, make rela build relationship with legislators in Nashville. And I think we've had some of that on this board. I'm not saying we've not, but, but so those that are, that are ready. I mean, what a time to be alive when parents have that choice, though. You have the choice to let your kids stay at home and, and learn from, you know, backside of a computer or whatever. I'm a tech guy. I understand how that all works. But, you know, but, uh, but I, I still believe, no matter what, uh, public education is the best format. Or I wouldn't be here. I wouldn't put my name in the hat if I didn't truly believe that public education is still very viable and still the best option for most kids. It is for my kid. And well, like I said, I already had one graduate, and I've got another one with five years left. So there's there's no decision to be made there in our house. Um, obviously, you know our son's going to continue on through school. He's had a, he's had a great experience so far, and we expect that to continue. But we need we need people who will continue to go to bat uh, and really talk to build those relationship with Nashville because we know what they're facing. You know, we've got uh, they're, they're they're being offered some uh, let's just say some opportunities to uh, to vote a certain way and we'll just leave it at that uh, but anyway we got to realize it is about kids it is about money's got to be there to not only provide education for kids but it's already been mentioned retain great teachers administrators and all those things so uh, that's what that's what this next board faces this board's already faced it for uh, last 20 years and beyond but it'll it's not going to stop anytime soon so we need people ready to take up the fight and continue thank you all right. Thank you, Stuart Jones. And that concludes that question. A couple more questions and then closing statements to go tonight. Uh, these are the candidates for the Oneida Special School District Board of Education. Uh, the next question will be opened by Dr. Nancy Williamson. And Dr. Williamson, the question would be about complaints. As a board member, you'll receive complaints. I bet you're aware of this. Uh, and, and so my question would be the process of handling a complaint. What would be your, what is your process as a current board member? The process, you, you have to follow the protocol. The board is not the problem solver. You start at the bottom. Is it, have you talked to the teacher? Have you talked to the principal? Have you talked to the administration, the, the superintendent? Then the superintendent decides if the board is to be involved. Now, you can follow up and see if anything was done, but as a board member, you have no, uh, no control over handling a specific complaint. You, you direct the person to the right steps to get the answer. And like I said, you can follow up and see what was done about it and see what the issues are. All right, thank you, Dr. Williamson. And next will be Cody Pike. Cody, the question is, as a prospective board member, a complaint is brought to you. What's your process to handle that? Well, as a board member, I would presume that I would have some sort of email access that's available for the public to be able to reach out with problems. Um, I do agree that there is a, a chain of hierarchy that should be followed, but however, I would encourage people who do have concerns that are not being met to reach out to board members. I mean, that is our role. We are the liaison between the school, the public, and the superintendent. Because if there are continued problems that are not having any resolution met, in my eyes, that should be part of our role. We should be able to sit down with the director of schools and identify the problem, identify the source, and lay out processes of resolution for it. Thank you, Cody. Next will be Missy Sexton. Missy, the question here is a complaint is brought to you. You're a board member. What's your process to handle that? Um, like, like was already mentioned, um, I do believe there is, I know there's a hierarchy. There's, there is a board of, or a chain of command to go through. But whenever the parents have legit issues that they're bringing to you, be, I, th I think as a board member, you know, we, as a board member, we will be voting for policies. It'll also be our responsibility to make sure that those policies are being implemented. And if they're not, maybe we could sit down with the director and, and plan out something. I don't, I don't know, I mean, how that would look, but 
if the parent has or if uh, if the community member has a, a a complaint we as board members need to be open to them and listen to what they have to say as not only taxpayers parents members of our community that are supporting our school thank you missy next will be Stuart Jones and Stuart the question again is complaints will come to you what will be your process for approaching complaints that have been brought to you as a school board member absolutely there those are going to come um, I think there may be a little misconception and Dr. Williamson's already addressed it collectively as a five-member voting board the school board has one one employee so if it's if it's something raises to the level of the superintendent you may be hearing it you know uh, if it's not handled at that level uh, i can't remember any time my time on the board that ever happened but you still you know you still hear complaints but again being married to a teacher uh, all teachers would uh, really respect that a parent would come to them first that's always your first line and then if, if you don't get a suitable resolution We've got great teachers, uh, absolutely great teachers, and, and uh, I could list several of them by name and, and beyond, and, and I'm so proud of all of them, but, you know, start there. They'd, they'd really appreciate it as well if you'd, if you'd start with there. You can't go straight to the board because, in effect, as everybody said, that would require probably a policy change, or we've got a major reoccurring issue if it's getting that high up, which we don't anticipate any of those. Uh, but. Anyway, start with the teacher. If that doesn't work, go to administration and then, then work your way up before. Uh, but, you know, as a board member before, and, and um, I want to serve you as a board member, obviously moving forward, or I wouldn't be sitting in this chair. Uh, I'll be very easily accessible. Like I said, you'll find me most any ball game. You'll find me uh, Facebook. You know, my number's been the same for 20 years. So if you've got it or need it, let me know. But uh, very accessible, you know, at any time, and I'll listen. Sometimes you just got to listen. Sometimes you just need an ear. But I don't rush any decision. I don't rush. I don't rush any uh, conclusions without gathering, you know, facts, data, evidence. That's so. That's also crucial. But I do that in any decision I make. I make sure I collect all the data and evidence. Stand back, take a look, think about it before acting irrationally. Make sure we do what's in best interest of the kid first, the parents and the students. All right, thank you, Stuart. And then the final uh, participant to answer on this, Dr. Danny Cross. Dr. Cross, complaints come to you as a school board member. How do you handle that? Well, I think you've heard the same answer over and over this afternoon. I mean, you listen. I mean, that's all you can do. You're one-fifth of the board, and you can't make any decisions on your own. And I'm listening to what Missy is saying right now. But now, whether or not there will be a resolution to what she, I don't, but I do think we can try. And but there is a reason for the hierarchy, if you want to call it that. Start with the teacher if there is a teacher problem. But if it's just things that's going on in the hallway and things like that, that goes the principal. I mean, that, but that just it just stops us from being chaos and you know in the in the organization trying to because there we'll never get. Uh, the problem solved by, by trying to skip uh, rungs of the ladder as we go. And I think being on it, the board in 20 years, we've seen uh, some of a little bit of everything. I've seen uh, times that the board has had to meet on issues of discipline or in, and things of that sort where it's come to that point and just couldn't, you know, the parents wanted to, to go to that uh, and we've done it and sometimes it's a heartache but it's one of those things that you do what you think is best that's the only thing you can do anyway and look at the facts and and listen to your superintendent uh, your principals and what they have because they are the professionals and we do have professionals in our system and they uh, you have to look at that and use that profession as best you can and again that's what I do I listen first and then pray. All right. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And so that concludes uh, the question of complaints. And now we move to Cody Pike. He is first on this question. And this question, Cody, is asking you to look into the future. You've been elected to the board and it's 2028. What would you like to 
to be able to say, here's what we accomplished in my four years on the board? That's a very tough answer to, to, or question to answer, I'm sorry there, but, you know, I hope at the end of four years, if I'm elected, you know, I want to see all of our extracurricular activities be much better than they are today. Um, one specific example comes to mind is, is uh, the band was posting asking for donations to buy a pair of shoes. We should not be eliciting donations to buy shoes for our students to participate in the band. I hope that we can continue to build upon what the previous predecessors have done. Let's continue increasing the, the funding and everything that we need to continue building and giving the physical resources to the school that they need. But on top of that, I also want to open the door to, like I said, let's really empower our teachers to teach. I feel like, you know, sometimes in a lot of professions, policies and procedures have kind of tied their hands, and I hope that we can reevaluate things and make sure that, you know, they're doing what's best for our kids. You know, I said my goal is I don't care if you graduate from Oneida and you go to college, go to vocational school, you go to the Army, whatever. But my goal is, is that when you leave Oneida, you have the ability to take care of yourself and be a productive member of society. Right. Thank you, Cody Pike. Next, Missy Sexton. Misty, the question. Uh, Missy, I'm, I You're apologize. good. You're good. No, <laughs> looking into the future, it's 2028. You have served the board for four years. What would you like to see have accomplished in that time? I would like for our kids and our parents to feel safe, to be okay with go with their kids being in school, and those those kids live to go on to their future. And I think that there we, I hope that we can step up and be this safe haven that the parents need. You know, these these are their most prized possessions that they're sending to our care. And we need to respect that. Thank you, Missy. And next is Stuart Jones. Stuart, the question is, it's 2028. You've been on the board for four years. What accomplishments do you hope to be looking back on? There's a few that come to mind. Uh, again, I'd like to revert back to my earlier comments on facilities. You know. Um, like to see those continue to expand and they, they're certainly moving that direction. Uh, you know, they're already awesome, but you know, just a little more space for everybody to move around in and work. I think that makes for, for happy staff for sure and, and definitely a happy educational experience for our kids. Um, I'd also like to see higher teacher retention rates. Um, it, you know, I, I don't, it's not exclusive to Oneida. It's not exclusive to any surrounding district as well, but Teachers are leaving the profession in droves, and uh, we, we know that. What can we do to make it better? We've seen really through the TISA funding formula and uh, Governor Lee's initiative uh, through state legislator to see an increase in teacher salaries over the years, but I don't, I don't think that's truly the only answer. Uh, teachers need to feel empowered, they need to feel respected, and they, they need to really have the cuffs taken off. I hear it all the time, uh, whether it... Uh, whether teachers from the Oneida School District or teachers from uh, the school district in which I work is, uh, if I could just teach, you know, if I could just, if they just let me teach. And I know a lot of these mandates are coming down from state levels, but let's let our let's empower our teachers. Let's let them teach and let's make them feel valued every day. I know it gets hectic. I know it gets tiresome. Some days are a little more of a struggle than others, and you know, you don't know what that challenge that day's challenges is going to be. But let's support them. Let's continue to empower them. And uh, I think in the end, we'll continue to see teacher retention rates go up. Those four-year degrees are valuable in other workplaces as well, and, and a lot of other workplaces are realizing that and taking their teachers right from out, out from underneath us. So let's do what we can to keep them, and really that'll help uh, our students to achieve more. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart Jones. Uh, for your answer on that question. And now we turn to Dr. Danny Cross and Dr. Cross. Uh, you had another four years on the board. It's 2028. You're looking back. What do you hope newly to accomplish in these next four years? Well, you know, I was just looking at some information we had the other day. We have a five-year strategic plan. I would like to, and I don't remember every one. I do remember some, uh, the first one, and that's completion of this 
elementary gymnasium. We need that space so bad, and I hope the public knows that we that's one of our priorities. The hold up on that is it's electricals, it's supply chain things. Uh, we have the money in place to complete it, and, and I think do it well, and it's a nice building. And uh, we've used, I think we've used uh, the monies that were ESSER funds, we call from the COVID. Uh, I, I think we've used that well. And I'd like to see that. Of course, we've got plans for uh, paving. I'd like to see those things. And all of those things are important in producing the best product we can. And I agree with Missy. Our most important asset in her, is her son and the children of our district. That's our most important asset we have. And I know we can come up with all kinds of different things and ways we might can do that, but I just think that we can, as a board, and we got good board members, don't ever make that mistake. I, mean, I'm, I, I, don't, I want to be the best I can be. We've got good board members now, and we'll have even more if we're off. I, we've got good people, and I understand where they're coming from. We have good candidates because we have good people in our community. And I just appreciate uh, the town of Oneida and I've appreciated uh, serving on our Oneida Special School District. And, and that's, I want to appreciate that even more in four years and a half. I just have joy about it. I just enjoy it. I don't know, I don't know of a better word I can use to describe that. It's a joy to, to serve. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And finally on this question, Dr. Nancy Williamson, Dr. Williamson, you're given four more years on the board. It's 2028. 20, Between now and then, what are you hoping to look back on as accomplishments in this time? Uh, I too am concerned about the high teacher turnover. But here again, our hands are tied. We are given guidelines that have to be followed. Uh, one of the pressures on them right now is this horrible third grade retention law that was passed. And there's been some modifications to it, but you never, never make a decision on one data point. And that's what they're doing. The teachers are under such pressure. We've uh, implemented the National Institute for uh, Excellence in Teaching that has helped teachers to uh, refine lessons and bring students on board to really help them retain the, the information that they're provided but uh, contact with the legislators. Let them know what they're doing to the educational system by pushing teachers like this. And I, I'm with Cody on, teachers don't stay 40 years anymore. They can't take it. They hit 30 years and no matter how much they love it, I'm out of here, I can't do it anymore. Uh, the only thing we can do is just give them the support they need give them the materials they need, give them the extra training they need, and hope that they will, things will ease up from the state and federal levels that they will stay. And then of course the space. I, I hope that we can have a couple of more additions to take care of, of the students that are there that we can educate and bring them on board and have them ready to go out and face any career job that they they pursue all right i want to thank you ladies and gentlemen for uh, taking my questions and we have reached uh, the final section uh, this is a three minute closing statement it is the final stretch it is your chance to look into that camera and make the case to the folks who are voting in the Onada <coughs> special school district board of education race why you should be on that board for the next four years. I'll remind our viewers that we drew for order and so now we start from our right and move to our left. The first candidate to issue the closing statement will be Mr. Stuart Jones. Once again, thank you Tim, IHSN and uh, SFN Networks for, for hosting this. What a great opportunity. You know, you don't get to hear from each of us individually, but in one place you get to one-stop shop and listen to our ideas. In just 16 days, you all will go to the poll. If you're a voter who resides within the bounds of the Oneida Special School District, you'll go to the polls and you'll punch a name or two names or however you feel led, uh, however you've come to that decision on who you will vote on. Hopefully you've heard some things tonight you like from some of us and, and you're ready to, to move forward. You're putting the hands of your kids or 
maybe your neighbor's kids or maybe your grandkids, uh, some of those decisions into our hands. And uh, I feel I'm someone you can trust with those. I, I truly believe that I've been there before. Uh, like I said, I'm a parent, I'm a husband. Uh, you know, and, and I, I'm, an ed, you know, I'm in education myself. You know, I work, I work closely in IT with teachers, administrators every day, and students as well. So I, I see what goes on behind the walls of those, of those schools. But you have five candidates here tonight vying for two seats. For those that may not know, the Oneida Special School District Board of Education, these members, all five of them, do not get paid a dime. So why would five people want two seats on this education uh, district board? It's because we love it. We've told you before, absolutely, I love your kids. I love our schools. I love our facilities. I'm Oneida proud. Everywhere I go, I love to wear the O. And, uh, you know, I want, I want to work for you. I want to work. I want, I want to be your voice. I want, to, uh, I want to take your concerns. I want to listen to you. And I want to work for you, parents. I want to work for you, teachers. I want to work for you, administrators. I want to work for you, faculty, staff, paraprofessionals. Let me be your voice. And I ask tough questions. I get answers. Sometimes those questions aren't well received, but I'm going to keep asking until an answer is had. And so, anyway, I'd, like, I'd just like to say thank you. If you've watched this or will be watching this some, at any point in the future, just know that I have your child's best interest at heart. And I have our staff's best interest at heart, no matter what that may be. Thank you. God bless. Thank you, Stuart Jones. And now for a closing statement, uh, we'll turn to candidate Missy Sexton. Missy, you have the floor. Um, beyond my nerves tonight, I've, people that know me, they, they will joke and say, I say what needs to be said, not what you need to hear. I hope that you will give me the opportunity because I have been in the trenches with our kids. So, and so many of the parents know that your kids have came to my front porch just to tell me what was going on. And because they knew I would listen to them. Parents have done the same. If there's been an issue, they'll call me or they'll, they'll message me, Missy, what do I do? And I'll walk them through how to find out whatever they're needing to find out. I am hoping that, you know, we, I've not been on this board. I've not, and I don't really think they've had anybody like me. I, I have a giving heart. I have served this community my whole life. Um, my mom got me into adult protective services when I was 17. And I worked that, went into child protective services. I was a volunteer for the Storm Football League. I, I love my kids. I love your kids. And I, I think that I will be the difference that the parents need to see on that board. I think that I, feel, I am so much like the parents. They, I'm, I'm a common denominator with them. They don't feel like I'm above them. They, they know they can come to my front porch. They can call me on the phone. They can talk to me and they can tell me what's happening. And I will get to the bottom of it. I'll see what's going on. Um, I'm very well versed in the policies. Um, I read them constantly. I carry a big book with me. That way I, I have references of what's going on, what's, uh, you know, what's supposed to be going on. And if you want, if you have questions, come and talk to me. I'll, I'll tell you where I stand. I'm very straightforward. I'm honest to a fault. And I will, I will sit down and talk and I will, I will listen to you and we'll, we'll, we'll figure something out. Thank you. Thank you, Missy Sexton. Uh, closing statement and now uh, a, a final challenger. Cody Pike, uh, you have three minutes, if you would, just make your closing statement to the folks. Well, I want to thank everybody again for giving me the opportunity to speak and listen to what I have to say. You may be wondering what somebody in healthcare, why I have any interest in doing this. Um, I'm fairly young, I'm a young parent. Uh, my oldest will be four at the end of this month. But those are the reasons why. 
I have children who are growing up and they're going to go to Onada just like me and my wife both did. I have nieces, nephews, cousins. I have family who are deeply intertwined in, into this school system. I know that from a personal standpoint, when I graduated high school and I left for college, I was not prepared and I suffered many failures. And through everything that I've come back from, whether getting my master's degree from Vanderbilt or finishing up my doctorate degree from um, UT Memphis, I'm hoping to now come back home and take all of the experiences and everything that I've seen and all of the other people that I've talked to all the other the other professionals that I'm friends with, all the way to people who who just work in factories, people who've joined the military. I want to take all of our perspectives, especially from a younger standpoint, because times are different now. Uh, you know, when I started school, I remember them introducing typing class, and then now I can pull my phone out of my pocket right now, and we can have access to everything we need to know. The world's a changing place. And I think that my ability to be intertwined with everything that's going on and my decision-making skills and the, just the things that I've been exposed to in life are going to allow me to give a holistic approach to all of the problems that we face here. That in addition to being open to working with the community and working with the administration and working with our teachers, let's take what we have and let's, let's build a better future with it. Let's make Onada the place that people want to come to school and let's be the school that is continually producing not only superstars, the next president, but let's be known as a school that we're producing great human beings every day. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Cody. And next will be Dr. Nancy Williamson. Dr. Williamson, you have the floor for closing statements. Thank you. I've been in and out of education since 1964. The fall, I started my student teaching in Franklin County, Kentucky at Franklin County High School. I've seen some changes that are totally, I would never have dreamed would take place. And the saying is, we are preparing students for futures that we don't even know what, it, what they're gonna need. We have no idea what's out there that they're going to have to do. We have to think about how do we teach them to analyze, think, process information, and come to conclusions that they can apply in any situation at any time. Some of them will go on to college. They will do fine. Some of them aren't college material. Some of them will go to technical schools. They will do fine. That is my goal. I want to see every student that comes out of Oneida to have the same opportunity to succeed that I've had. I taught, went to school, got a master's degree, got my doctorate degree. I've been in other school systems doing school reviews. I've seen many, many sides of education in other areas. We have one of the best systems anywhere and people know where we're from when we're out somewhere and they'll say, oh yeah, we know about you. You do a great job up there. And that's what I want to continue. I want to continue supporting our teachers. They know where I stand. They know I support them. They know I'm behind them no matter what. And that's, that's the job, you support your teachers. One thing we've not mentioned is our fantastic food service program. Uh, we have people in Boston right now attending a national convention. I want to see our teachers be able to s attend a national convention in their area. There's nothing like it. You run into different situations and then you run into people from the other side of the country that are facing the same thing you are. But uh, our, our food service program and the convention they're attending, will they'll bring it back and our students will have better, healthier meals because of it. We have to support our teachers. We have to fight the legislature. And I do that constantly. You can ask Ken Yeager and Kelly Kiesling and they'll say, oh yes, we've heard from her. And I give them my opinion. This is what you need to be looking for and this is what you need to be doing. Don't forget our number one priority is the kids. 
they have to be number one and that's what we're working for. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Williamson. And we will end where we began with uh, Dr. Danny Cross. Dr. Cross, if you would, just give us your closing statement. I would, and I, sometimes it's difficult to close. <laughs> but I've enjoyed it, and we have wonderful candidates. I mean, I, and they're good people. I agree with that. And I, I guess, suppose, I've had some experiences in this life that might be worth mentioning, but I'm not going to. They don't have anything to do with my ability to be a board member and own out of schools. I've loved the 20 years that I've served. I've loved every bit of it. Uh, selfish as that may seem, but I hope it's not selfish. But, and I think that we've got some wonderful things going on in the own out of school system at this point where test scores are going up. Uh, well, as always, uh, someone said a long time ago, if you, uh, if you don't have any criticism at all, then you're not doing anything. Uh, you're going to have some of that. That's going to happen whether I'm on the board or anybody else is on the board. That is not going to go, to, go away. I, I'm a, uh, it's just, a, again, I've stated, I can't say it enough. I just enjoy it all. And I'll tell you what I, why I serve. I serve a risen Savior. And I can do all things through Him, but I cannot do a thing without Him. And that's who I look to to guide us in our school system. And uh, I just, we've got precious children, and I think they deserve my best each and every day. And uh, I want to continue to see things go on, continue to get better. And I think we've got a solid base to build from now, and I want to see it to fruition. Uh, and I just thank you, Town of Oneida and this Oneida Special School District for the years that you've given me. And I want to continue if that's possible, but we've got some good people that will take my place and do it even better, I'm sure. But I just thank you for this opportunity. And I thank you all. A group of fine professionals that's led us through this tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cross. And uh, we want to thank our viewers for joining us. I'm going to put uh, a couple of guys that are out of the spotlight tonight. I'm going to ask Ben Garrett if he can give me a quick statistic. Uh, and that would be voter turnout rate uh, for, for Scott County. About what, doesn't have to be exact, about what would you say it has been over the past few years? 35%. So Ben's got it at 35%. He's not mic'd up. So let me, let me say this. I heard this said the other day. Uh, you have seen some outstanding candidates tonight from Tiffany Jeffers for Assessor of Property, Diane Chambers-Smith in the 2nd District for Scott County School Board, Curtis Bruce and Chris Shelton for 3rd District in Scott County School Board. You've seen Stuart Jones, Missy Sexton, Cody Pike, Dr. Nancy Williamson, Dr. Danny Cross, and you've heard from all of them. Not an easy thing to do. Uh, but they cared enough to come and share their views with you. But there's one candidate that, uh, that goes unmentioned a lot of times, and that candidate wins almost every time, and Ben just proved it. That candidate, I'm sitting on it right now. It's the couch. Voter turnout is important. It's a right. There are people who have sacrificed a lot for your right to get out and vote and make your voice heard. So that's why we're here doing this tonight. And by we, the two you didn't see, Mr. Independent Herald is Ben Garrett, and Mr. South Fork Network is Greg Bond. And without them, none of this is possible. We feel like this is a service to the community, to people who want to be servants for this community. And I want to heartily thank them and remind you that early voting is open through July 27th. Election day is August the 1st. Please exercise your right to get out and make your voice heard. For all those involved in the candidate forum for the Independent Herald here tonight, this is Tim Smith saying thanks for joining us and have a very good evening.